the uh, this is really the last uh, message on the book of Romans for a little while at least and uh, we have um, gone through oh, approximately 50 different messages on the book all arranged under the theme of the book which is righteousness and um, you'll remember that when we started uh, maybe you don't remember I barely remember myself but when we started our study in the book we hit Romans chapter 1 and uh, the first seven verses which I want to call our attention to before we start the end of chapter 16 so we're looking at the beginning of the book and then the end of the book and I think you'll find that the beginning of the book and the end of the book kind of form a nice uh, really wraparound of the whole book and uh, verse 1 in chapter 1 starts with Paul Paul mentions his gospel and obedience to the faith in, the, in Romans chapter 16 and notice what it is said here Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God which he promised before through his prophets the gospel of God which was promised before through his prophets only problem is is that nobody knew it all right <laughs> it was something that was prophesied but something that was somewhat of a mystery and we find that out in Romans chapter 16 in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who is born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead it was the resurrection of Jesus Christ that proved his deity through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among not just Jerusalem and the Jews but among all nations it says in the text for his name among whom you also were the called of Jesus Christ and there's this bestowal of grace here in verse 7 as well now go to Romans chapter 16 and hopefully we can see uh, the similarity between the opening of the epistle and then the close of the epistle verse 21 Romans 16 and verse 21 it says Timothy my fellow worker and Lucius Jason and Sospater my countrymen greet you I Tertius who wrote this epistle greet you in the Lord Gaius my host and the host of the whole church greets you Erastus the treasurer of the city greets you and Quartus a brother the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all amen now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret it was proclaimed by the prophets in chapter 1 but it was kept secret since the world began but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God and here's the phrase again for obedience to the faith to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever amen now we start with um, the uh, names again we looked at the first part of the chapter it was loaded with names and Paul was commending fellow believers in Christ that were at Rome and we looked at those individuals in the first part of the chapter now we have a list of different names and it's very difficult to tell why these are disconnected from the rest of the list I'm not exactly sure other than perhaps uh, Tertius is the one that is noticing these people now my my question to you is why does it say that Tertius wrote the epistle uh, didn't Paul write the epistle under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit I mean we know that over and over again Paul is named as the author of the of the book of Romans well he did but Tertius seems to be um, a, a secretary of sorts and he you know this is not inspiration where Tertius is inspired all right this is Paul inspired and he is asking Tertius to write down what what needs to be write down written down so the idea there is there's a um, he is being dictated to by the Apostle Paul and writing exactly what needs to be written and so he quite literally means that I wrote this epistle with pen and ink basically and so that's what I think is happening here he wrote the epistle under Paul's direction Timothy we know um, he worked closely with Paul certainly if Tertius was with the men he would have been a co-worker of Timothy as well 
uh, Lucius and Jason and Sospater, uh, although a different spelling in the book of Acts, uh, seem to have mention in Acts. We're just not sure if they're the exact same men because a lot of times people are named the same name, like Gaius, for instance, who's the next person that's mentioned. I don't think it's the same Gaius that is mentioned in the epistles of John, although it could be. We're just not sure. And so... Um, he, Gaius, is the host of the church at Rome. Now that, that's what he's talking about when he says, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. My host, Paul, Tertius, the men there, I think maybe Gaius was a man that out of hospitality extended himself and made sure that when people came in that were traveling, believers, he made sure that he extended himself to them and provided a place for them to stay. I also think that when he says the host of the whole church, that he must have been a man of some means, and he probably hosted the whole church when they assembled. The whole church at Rome, not the whole church throughout the world. Uh, guess we could do that with the uh, digital uh, means available today. But... The idea there is he hosted the church, a local church at Rome that Paul was addressing. Erastus is mentioned, uh, not much is known about this man other than he's the treasurer of the city of Rome, which seems to be a very high and lofty position. And so he's a man of some influence and probably some means. Um, some argue over whether treasurer should be something that's a little bit more diminutive and not in the sense of a treasurer that we think of today, maybe just kind of like a city official working in the city as a clerk. Uh, we just don't know. Then Quartus is mentioned, and, and that's it, just his name. He's a fellow believer. Um, why is he mentioned? We don't know. Probably because he was a well-known believer in Rome, and, and God wanted him remembered in the epistle. Uh, but that's about all that we know about this man. Anything else that we would say would be conjecture. So this leads then to the final message of the book, which is the substance of tonight. And all along, when we started chapter 12 and we moved all the way through chapter 16, we've been trying to apply the righteousness of God to our lives as believers. We talked about the need for righteousness, the gift of righteousness, demonstrating the righteousness of God in our lives, a vindication of righteousness in Romans 9 through 11. And now we are talking about the application of God's righteousness in Romans 12 through 16. And that application has taken various forms. And it says here in verse uh, 25, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Or to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So here is a gospel that was hidden in the prophetic scriptures. Which scriptures are we talking about here? Well, the Old Testament. Hidden there and yet still prophesied there. Something that was hidden but yet was there. See, that sounds a lot like the Gnostics, you know. Some kind of secret knowledge that only the Masons can have, right? You become a 32nd degree poobah or whatever they are, and then you finally figure out what's being said here. No, I don't think it's that at all. I think that God made sure that these things were there, plain truth, right there, but they, weren't, they were not things that you're going to understand until they were actually fulfilled. And I think that that's what's happening in the Old Testament. Now, I... I have to admit to you that I have a bias. I'm a dispensationalist, so I believe that there is more discontinuity than maybe a Reformed or Covenant theologian believes there is. They want to see more continuity between the Testaments. I just don't th th see it that way. And one reason is because of texts like this one. All right? uh, we, we see something that was concealed but now is revealed, and this is called a mystery. So when you look at the word mystery in the New Testament, it's not a mystery in the sense that it's now obscure. It's a mystery in the sense that it was obscure back then. 
But now that everything's been fulfilled, it's certainly not mysterious to us. It still may have been rocky at the time that Paul wrote, even. But through the progress of time and the progress of revelation, these things have become abundantly clear to us. And one of these things he names right here, all the nations, which is referring to Gentiles, now exercise obedience that comes from faith. That is, they have to put their trust in Christ who died for them. And once they do that, they're able to obey. Paul knows nothing of a faith that does not work. All right? Just like James. It's very consistent in the New Testament. Faith works. And so sometimes he'll use the word obedience and faith interchangeably because of that. It's confusing to us because we want to say, oh, that's work salvation. But what we need to keep in mind is that that faith, that dependence upon Christ's work comes first. And then that works itself out in our lives as we do good things for Christ. Uh, the, you say, well, wh when did this all get done? When, when did God plan all of this? He planned it even before time began, uh, the Bible tells us. And so therefore he deserves glory through Jesus Christ. So we look at it this way. The Father, he wisely planned redemption. And then the Son carried it out sacrificially. He took the plan that the Father laid out before him and he said, yes, Father, I will do this. And he came to earth and he died for you and for me. And so I think that that's why the first seven verses of the epistle should be compared with the last few verses that we see here in Romans chapter 16 because their message is essentially the same. They are both talking about this concept of obedience to the faith. Or we could say obedience that comes from from faith. That's what the phrase obedience to the faith means. It's a genitive actually. So um, it's coming from faith, our faith. Now Paul returns to this theme. Now let's just explore this idea of how a gospel that we know so well could have been hidden in the Old Testament and now revealed here in the New Testament. I mean that is a little confusing, isn't it? Well, the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed by Paul. It's proclaimed by other believers in the New Testament. What we're saying is that it was predicted in the Old Testament. But it doesn't seem to be evident, especially to other believers, all right, Old Testament saints. They don't understand what you and me understand. I don't have a problem with that because what I say to myself is, well, God revealed what he revealed. And he's going to hold people accountable for the revelation that they have received. Now, some people have a real problem with that because what they'll say is, well, then I guess there are two Gospels. They, they, they get like that. And what we say is, no, there, there's only one Gospel, but it's not fully understood until Jesus comes and executes the plan. And that's what we're seeing, I think, here. It's foreshadowing in the Old Testament, and then the significance comes across after that fulfillment of the promise. Uh, my professors used to say to me, it was concealed, but now it has been revealed. And that's kind of a neat way to think of it. So now we understand some things. What do we understand? Well, we understand that the Gentiles participate in the Abrahamic covenant, right? I mean, wouldn't have occurred to us uh, as far as uh, the Old Testament uh, it states it, although we, we should get the drift from Genesis 12 and verse 3, when we see that in Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. But how they will be blessed and how all that's going to be carried out and how it relates to land and what's going on with Abraham specifically, that was yet still foggy. You say, well, how do we participate uh, in, in what is promised to Abraham? Well, we have the same thing that Abraham has, according to Romans 4. And what is that? Faith. Faith is the operative word there. Not the fact that we're the head of some nation or anything like that, but the fact that uh, we exercise faith just as Abraham exercised faith. Because Abraham was pre-law, right? And so we have that in common with him. And so that's why Abraham compares us with him, or why Paul compares us with Abraham. And it's just what I said today. The, the root uh, of salvation is by faith alone. The fruit of that salvation is by faith alone as well. Now, Gentiles need to hear the preaching of, of Christ. And 
and his life, his death, and his resurrection. Now what's interesting is that this happened slowly. When Jesus came, who did he primarily introduce himself to? Jewish people. All right? Not to Gentiles. Although he had exchanges with Gentiles, they were rare. Was that true with the church too? I mean, we just went through the book of Acts. Yeah. I mean, we see every the gospels being opened up according to Romans or Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria, and to the uttermost parts, the nations, all the nations. But that was going to unfold in the progress of time. So Gentiles, it, they were going to catch on to this slowly. They were going to understand and be saved by the fact that Jesus died, was buried, he rose again. And that made them different from, what, from, from the Old Testament saints. Not a different gospel, but what we understand is different. And there's no problems uh, there, at least in my mind, with that kind of thinking. You say, well, what, what, what is happening right now in the age in which we live? Well, we, we started a new age in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, right? What is that new age? The church age. At Pentecost, that's when the church began. So, so here's the question. Did the church exist before Pentecost? Did the church exist in the Old Testament? And the answer is no. It's never mentioned in the Old Testament. It did not exist. Jesus said in Matthew 16, this is the first mention of the church. In Matthew 16, he said, I will build my church. He, he did not say, I'm going to add on to my church. He said, I'm going to build it. Uh, you know, and that's exactly what he has done. He has built his church and we are a part of that church. You say, when will this church age end? Well, I believe it will end uh, when the Lord removes the church at judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. You say, what will happen? We will be forcefully taken away. If you don't like the word rapture, use the word harpazo. You're going to be forcefully removed from uh, the earth and you're going to be taken uh, to be with the Lord and you're going to be with him um, forever at that point. You say, well, what happened after that? Well, then God will turn to the Jews whom he provoked to jealousy by the Gentiles, right? He'll turn to the Jews and, and he will deal with them through the seven-year tribulation and even into the millennial period. So all, although there are many mentions of, of the additional focus on Gentile peoples in the Old Testament, I don't think the Old Testament saints understood all of it. So Genesis 12, 3, all the families of the earth will be blessed in Abraham. Did they understand that Jesus of Nazareth would be the Messiah, that he would come and die for their sins and be buried and rise again? No, not even the inner circle of disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ understood that, even when they were told it explicitly three times. So no, they, they didn't understand that. Or Deuteronomy. Uh, turn with me to Deuteronomy 32 and verse 20. Deuteronomy 32. We can't look at all of these, but I wanted to just look at a few of them. Deuteronomy 32 and uh, verse 20. This is an interesting passage. It says, And he said, the Lord, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. And notice what it says in this last part here. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. Does that sound familiar? Okay, it should. It's in Romans chapter 10 and verse 19 and we've gone over it. So you say, well, what's happening here? Paul quotes Deuteronomy uh, 32 in Romans chapter 10, because he has a burden for who? For Israel, right? And that's who God is trying to reach, right? Here in Deuteronomy 32 in this warning. Here's an interesting statement in 2 Samuel 22 and verse 15. This is just before David dies. He says that he will give thanks to the Lord among the Gentiles and sing praises to his name. That same statement, which appears in Hebrews, by the way, is reiterated in Psalm 18 and verse 49.
David will sing praises among the Gentiles to the name of God. That's a pretty amazing passage of scripture to wrap your mind around. Uh, Psalm 117 and verse 1 calls for the Gentiles to praise the Lord. And then that great uh, passage in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10, we have the prophecies of the root or the branch of David, which is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gentiles, it says, shall seek them. So you have little glimpses, you know, uh, of the idea of the Gentiles coming in to the fold, so to speak. But you don't get all the detail that you get once all of this has been fulfilled. Otherwise, faith is not faith, right? And uh, now we have the whole revelation. Do you suppose we're more culpable and more responsible because of that? And the answer is, surely we are. By the way, there is something else that's quite extraordinary that is often overlooked. In Revelation chapter 4, all, right, all the way up to chapter 3, I think it's verse 22, the church is mentioned, obviously. Uh, the seven churches taking on different personas. Uh, really, re we can relate to all of them, can't we, at certain points in time. But, but the idea of the church then drops off the pages of Scripture in Revelation 4. It is not brought up again until you get to the end of Revelation 19. Okay? So, uh, Revelation 4 all the way to Revelation chapter 19, no mention of the church. Now, let me just leave you with this. And maybe this would be profitable for your own study. There are six mystery passages in the New Testament. But they're no longer mysteries to us. Okay? These are things that we now fully understand and have been fully developed in the rest of the scripture. We have the whole word of God. Here's the first one that's mentioned. I'm just going to take them in chronological order here. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the Romans ones after the 1 Corinthians one. It says the, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51, Paul speaking of a mystery, and, and it says he is speaking of the time at the end of the church age when the saints will be raptured. He's referring to the rapture of the church. This was something that would have been very difficult to understand until we had the full developed theology of Paul, especially 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, and even some of the passages in John, like John chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Um, the second mystery passage is found in Romans chapter 11 and verse 25, and we've already looked at this one in detail uh, when we went through Romans chapter 11, but this mystery is the mystery of a partial blindness of Israel at the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. God is going to uh, deal with the Gentiles for the most part during the church age. But remember what I said, that doesn't mean that individual Jews will not get saved. But God has uh, given uh, them over as a whole people to this, that's why we say partial blindness. All right? Some people will come in, but for the most part Israel has rejected God and have become very apathetic about spiritual things as a nation. And so this is a mystery at one time referred to in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, but now it's no longer a mystery. And by the way, this is why the Jewish people rejected the kingdom offer of Jesus Christ. Jesus offered the kingdom, they rejected it. Now that's what the scripture reveals. Um, the third mystery passage is found here in our text in Romans chapter 16 verses 25 and 26 and be, of course we've already talked about it but being uh, since it's a mystery kept secret since the world began and what is that mystery? That God planned something that he would make himself known to all nations. How was he going to do that? He was going to do that through God the Son the Lord Jesus Christ. We know what that means now. Ephesians 2 verse 11 all the way through Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12 it explains the mystery of the church, which now is one new man containing both Jew and Gentile. There's no distinction. We all are in the same church. The Jewish person that becomes a Christian is not, um, you know, a superior Christian to you or to me. We're all equal. We're all the same in Christ. That's the argument there in that section of Ephesians. 
Ephesians 5, verse 32, I just preached on this last week, and I mentioned it at the wedding of uh, Seth and Allison. The idea of the mystery of a, a marital relationship and how it parallels Christ as the groom and his bride, the church. Paul says, Behold, I show you a great mystery. Of course, we know what that means now. It's not something that's concealed to us. We fully understand it. At least we should. And then the final mystery is Colossians 1 and verse 27, which speaks of a mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. That's the mystery. This would have been something that would have been very difficult for the Old Testament saints to wrap their minds around. You say, well, how is Christ in us, the hope of, of glory? He's in us because he resides in us through the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit indwells you. And sometimes he's referred to as the Spirit of Christ. We have the Spirit of Christ within us. And so we know the mind of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. He is constantly showing us Christ. And that brings us right back to God revealing righteousness through him. And so I hope that if you get anything from the study in Romans, one of the things that you want to take away is the key word, and that's righteousness. The righteousness of God has been revealed. It's not something that's concealed. We have it right before us. Let's pray together.